personal experience. Oop, hang on one second. All right, recording in progress. Excellent. All right, so, but I'll tell you lots of stories about me. You're going to think I'm just one big hot mess after this presentation. And uh, a little bit about me. I, as Josie said, I'm a nurse practitioner. I work in primary care and sleep disorders. And then I also teach nursing students at Kennesaw State University in Atlanta in pediatrics and now pathophysiology. And I have ADHD. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, one quick note that I just want to clarify is that um, lots of people will say that they have ADAD, ADD and not ADHD. And I used to do this a lot too. ADD is actually an outdated term. The definition changed back in like 1994. Um, now ADHD is that overarching theme. And we all have ADHD, those of us with the diagnosis, but we the difference is in the presentation. So you either have ADHD inattentive presentation or you have ADHD hyperactive impulsive presentation, or if you're like me, you have both, which is the most common presentation. So the study of ADHD is not done by any standard. We're still learning, we're still studying, we're still trying to understand it. So for today, what we're gonna do is we're going to start um, by defining ADHD and its symptoms. We'll talk about things that have really helped me understand it better. And then most of our time will be spent on tools that you can use to make school and life go smoother, like medication, daily life skills, in-class strategies, tips and tricks for studying for exams, and then the actual exam day. So let's come along over here and we're gonna talk about the definition. So this is how we define ADHD in medicine. ADHD is an ongoing pattern of inattention and either hyperactivity and impulsivity or both that interferes with functioning or development. And this is so true. ADHD affects every area, relationships, jobs, school, families, you name it. And um, symptoms are usually present before the age of 12, often before the age of seven. They show up in multiple settings, uh, like not just at home, but at home and work, school and work, school and, um, you know, home and school. We rule out other things that have similar symptoms like stress, sleep, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia. Um, and, but the big factor that sets ADHD apart from with, with these symptoms is that usually they've been present for as long as someone can remember. Two thirds of people with ADHD have some other disorder like depression or anxiety or dyslexia or dyscalculia where you have trouble with numbers. And then 50% of people with ADHD have three or more disorders like OCD, Tourette's, autism on top of that. Um, sort of a funny side note, there's a lot of parents that get diagnosed with ADHD after their kid has been diagnosed because they realize that, oh my goodness, I have all of those same symptoms. Um, it has genetic links. It runs in families. It can be caused by drugs and alcohol exposure and pregnancy. And then finally, by trauma, like neglect, abuse, adverse childhood experiences can put you at a higher risk for developing this. Uh, this is what we see in ADHD in attentive presentation. We tend, I'm going to say we because I have this. This is totally me. Um, we tend to present with poor listening skills. Um, we're disorganized, you know, we're often called messy or unprepared. Um, we tend to make careless mistakes and overlook details. And this is so me, I'm, I'm just terrible at proofreading, especially text messages. And I've sent some of the worst texts to people. Did you know that text, message, text messaging, when it first became popular, it used to autocorrect the word oops to poop? I'm not kidding. It, uh, I've definitely sent that to more than one person. And someone finally fixed it because it doesn't happen anymore, thankfully. But um, other things are we lose things. Phone, wallet, keys, glasses. We have a hard time sustaining attention on tasks, conversations, lectures. And if you're like me, you make really bad choices and you skip. I think I skipped oh, AP Humanities 20 times my final semester in high school. And yeah, I really don't know how I passed that course. <laughs> uh, we avoid or procrastinate on things that require like a good amount of mental energy, like paying bills, writing papers, starting homework. For me, I used to, I, it used to be laundry. If you had asked me, I would have told you it takes 30 minutes to fold a load of laundry. It's so not true, but that's what I thought. So I avoided it. We can't seem to complete tasks or 
projects. Our basements and attics are like full of half finished sewing projects or all the plants on the porch are dead because I didn't put them in the ground and I forgot to water them. Um, we're distracted by thoughts or outside stimulus. And here's the thing with ADHD. We're, it's not that we're more perceptive with noise or sounds. It's that we respond to them. I took the LSAT in college thinking I wanted to be a lawyer. And when I got to that four hour time test, I could not focus because of all the pencil scratching, paper turning, chair moving noise. I felt like I was surrounded by gerbils. It was so loud and I bombed that test. And finally, we forget daily activities like chores, laundry, <laughs> returning calls, class, birthdays, keeping appointments. My first time in college, I would forget my laundry in the machine for days until I just ran out of clothes. All right, and then here we go. This is hyperactivity presentation. These folks can be constantly fidgety, constantly talking, wanting to move around. Um, and these are the kids that like climb on top of their desks or need three recesses at school plus an hour on the trampoline afterwards. Uh, my husband, he has ADHD and he constantly needs something in his hands if he's sitting still. So he rolls up receipts. We find them like all over the house. They look like little doobies. So, and as kids, we've, we often had a hard, have a hard time playing quietly, talk nonstop. We have marked feelings of restlessness or we just can't relax. Uh, trouble staying in our seats in class. We tend to be overly talkative, sometimes oversharing information. And important to note with the hyperactivity is that around age 19 or 20, this hyperactivity transitions to feelings of restlessness, not actual hyperactive behavior in adults. These, ten, these folks tend to say, I'm a multitasker, um, when you know that's great if you're actually completing tasks. So um, impulsivity, this is the person that may act or speak without thinking or have difficulty with self-control. Uh, these folks may have regular emotional or angry outbursts, which can be really hard to stay married or have friends, um, often called super sensitive. These folks tend to interrupt before the other person's done talking or speaking. Uh, you tend to make important decisions without considering like the long-term consequences, uh, like buying a house, getting married, quitting a job. Um, we tend to blurt out answers or complete other people's sentences. And then also finally, frequent injuries or automobile accidents. Um, oh my goodness, this is my second grader. She, uh, she hits her head at least twice a day. Um, she runs into things all the time. She's always getting hurt. I just want to like wrap her in bubble wrap and put a helmet on her. Um, she just got 100% on a book report presentation, but then she got five points taken off because she was talking while other people were presenting. I just want to like kiss and strangle her all at the same time. But she's, you know, she's precious. She's great. But she's also like, she's my no filter kid. <laughs> all right. So with all this being said, what are the benefits of ADHD? Um, we tend to be really very good in adapting to stressful situations because we live in the now. We see a need and we meet it. We tend to function better in performance-based professions where someone is watching you. So like the military, athletes, actors, firefighters, EMTs, emergency rooms, and teachers, if you're organized enough. So um, famous people with ADHD include Michael Phelps, John F. Kennedy, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, and probably Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he was known to work on many projects at once and really have trouble completing tasks. So we are very generous. You never know what we're gonna say, especially when we have like impulse control problems. Um, we can be very passionate about things that we like. We are risk takers. We're very resilient and creative because we are quite used to things not working out and trying to figure out a way that does. Um, we're more likely to start our own business and we can hyper focus. I'm sure you've had times where something interested you so much that you could just churn out volumes of information or commit hours of time. Last fall, I made a video for my sister when she and her husband were adopting and it felt like it took 20 minutes, but really I sat there for four hours, no bathroom breaks, no food, no water. And I loved every minute of it, just putting videos and pictures together. Um, that intense focus and tunnel vision is our superpower. Not many people can do that. It's a great thing if you're writing a book. It's not so good if it's a Netflix show that you're binge watching. <laughs> so 
I love this picture because it gives you a good idea of what the world sees and then what actually is happening for us. Um, so really quick, some more background on me. I've had so many of these symptoms for as long back as I can remember. I can recall doing great on tests and when I was interested in the subject matter, but in classes where it was hard or boring, I had trouble paying attention. I would forget what was taught. I'd forget to do the homework. I'd get D's by mid quarter. And then I would struggle to get grades back up to C's. And then you throw in puberty and hormones and then there's just a whole nother thing to get distracted with. So I was far more interested in talking to my friends than in actually doing schoolwork. I, I know I drove my parents nuts because so many evenings they'd sit me down and discuss my bad grades and not turn in assignments. And they'd ask me, you know, what can we do to help? And they asked if I needed tutors and, and what would work. And I was like, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I just said, I, I try harder. So I really struggled with depression in middle school, high school, and, and also college. I thought life was too hard. I could not meet the world's expectations. I couldn't stick with anything. I'd heard these things over and over again. I had, try not to cry. Um, I had lots of thoughts of suicide. And one night I had a plan that I thankfully didn't follow through on, but life was just too much work. And I was letting everybody down. I felt like I just, I couldn't do anything right. So people with ADHD are at a higher risk for suicide, for substance abuse disorders, binge eating disorders, and we're more likely to die young due to risk-taking accidents, self-medicating, and just not taking care of our health. In college, my dad was actually the one who recommended I be tested for ADHD after I got into two fender benders in six months. Um, when I was diagnosed, it was junior year of college and the psychiatrist was like, I'm, I'm actually really surprised you graduated college. And I was like, oh yeah, I know, so am I. So um, I was put on Adderall, which it instantly made a difference. It was game changing. I can remember being a waitress at the time and all of a sudden, I could keep track of my tables. I was not overwhelmed. I knew what people were ordering. Um, and then I went back to college in Boston and I forgot to refill my medication. When I finally went to the pharmacy, they said they were expired. It was too much effort to call the psychiatrist. So I just stopped taking my medication and I continued to struggle. One thing that has really helped me understand ADHD is the concept of executive function. And here's what it is. Executive function, it's a, co it's a set of cognitive processes that's in the front half of your brain. Uh, it's in the prefrontal cortex, your personality right there. And what it does is it, is, it helps you self-regulate. -re this is your control center so that you can plan, prioritize, and be motivated to achieve that long-term goal, like save up money to buy a house or get an A in English. This has nothing to do with how smart you are. It's not about what you know. It's all about doing what you know. And this is where we fall in ADHD. ADHD is a performance disorder. It is not a cognitive disorder. You can be very smart and still have trouble getting things done, getting things down on paper, doing that assignment, controlling that emotional outburst. And oh my goodness, this was so profound for me when I figured this out. No longer did I have to think that there was something absolutely broken or wrong with me. It's not that I don't know. It's that I struggle to do what I know. Development of this area starts when we're young and it is fully developed by the time we're 25. But here's the thing with ADHD. Most researchers, most researchers now believe that our brains develop slower and are not fully mature until around our mid thirties. That's like a 30% lag behind those that don't have ADHD. And this is why we may seem more immature than the kids around us in school. And remember what I said about you can actually develop ADHD through neglect and abuse. And this makes so much sense, doesn't it? Because if something happens to you as that part of your brain is developing, it impacts the end product. If you have ADHD, all of these areas in executive function are affected, but to different degrees. Some people have more severe degrees of impairment than others. You may really struggle with like emotional control where that's not such a big issue for me. 
I really struggle with self-monitoring, which is that inner concept of time. I, you know, I think I had enough time to clean the kitchen and then realize, oh my goodness, I'm late for work. Um, I'm totally off on how long it actually takes to complete tasks. I struggle to initiate tasks. I procrastinate, you know, when something's going to be boring. Impulse control is a, is a big one. I have a really hard time delaying gratification. If, if something looks good, I want to eat it now. So, um, but we're still researching executive functioning and seeing if retraining helps, you know, does cognitive behavioral therapy help for impulse and emotional control. But, you know, the, the evidence is not back, you know, it's, we're still looking at this. So now that you know about executive function and dysfunction, so what do you do? We, what we do is we build social scaffolding around you to help you in the environment. And you have to use tools out there because your brain doesn't already have these things built in. So really quick, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what boosts executive function and what refuels that tank. And the number one thing, it's amazing, is medication. The number one thing that boosts executive function is medication. There is just nothing more effective. 90% of adults with ADHD respond to medication that's so much higher than the response that we get for all those antidepressant drugs that we throw at people and all those anti-anxiety medications. Those are like 40 to 60%. 90% is just mind boggling. Um, research continues to show that, yeah, there's nothing more effective than stimulant medication for ADHD. And that's amphetamines like Adderall, that's methylphenidate, which is like Ritalin and Concerta. All these guys work by boosting dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is that neurotransmitter that's involved with feelings of pleasure and regulation of attention. And research has shown that people with ADHD were deficient in dopamine. We tend to have less response to it. And they've actually identified one gene, they're still doing more research on it, but there's one gene that makes it difficult for the neurons in our brain to respond to dopamine, to respond to those feelings of pleasure and the regulation of attention which is why it's really easy to understand why folks with ADHD, we have a really hard time delaying gratification. We're constantly looking for something to make us feel better because we're not getting that same dopamine surge in our brains that you know, like normal brains would. For me, on medication, I'm able to start tasks that normally I'd procrastinate on. I'm able to maintain focus on boring tasks. I can complete tasks that previously I would start and just not finish sewing projects, lots of those. I don't feel overwhelmed and I remember things more easily. Uh, with medication, I feel like, or without my medication, I feel like I'm slowly sinking in quicksand. That's, that's the best thing I can think of it. But when I take my medication, that ground floor solidifies. And all of a sudden, I'm not so overwhelmed. I can climb out. It just helps me tremendously. For some people, it can be life-saving. Like it was for me, it was life-saving. All of a sudden, my anxiety and depression improved tremendously when I started to accomplish tasks and get things done. I did not feel like so much of a failure. And besides medication, exercise. Exercise refuels executive function and it's a double whammy, it pumps dopamine into your brain. Research shows that it significantly improves attention and decreases our frustration and impulsiveness. For ADHD, exercise is a must. If I exercise like first thing in the morning, I feel like I've conquered the hardest part of my day. Everything else is just tremendously easier. Uh, for example, one semester in college, first time, uh, I was training for a marathon and it was the most productive semester I've ever had. I had straight A's. This was out without medication, straight A's. I ran long runs four times a week and I studied for the LSAT. Uh, exercise kept me sane and productive. It also showed me that I didn't have lots of extra time. I could only do a few things and I needed to get them done now, not later. So here are daily life hacks. With ADHD, number one thing is we tend to be time blind. An easy way to solve that problem is just put clocks in every room. Make sure you have a watch, preferably one that you can set a timer on. That's the, that's the like number one thing I use my watch for is timers. Time yourself doing daily activities and write it down. 
So no Kate, it doesn't take 30 minutes to fold laundry. It really only takes 10 minutes to fold and put away clothes. It, you know, it's it fabulous to learn that. Uh, lists, write lists, write out a to-do list. It helps me not feel overwhelmed. I can see what needs to be done and it's not this just unspoken dread floating around in my head. Landing pad. Have you ever tried to like walk out the door and then you have to look for 10 or 15 minutes to find your keys? Remember how we struggle with organization when we have ADHD? Make sure you have a place for everything and everything in its place. So for example, there's just certain things that live in my backpack. They never come out. And my backpack goes on that same hook in the closet every time. This never changes or I'm in big trouble. So it's my keys and my ID badge. They're always there. My ADHD medication is in there because otherwise I get to work and I forget to take it. I'm at the hospital on Fridays and at the clinic on Saturdays. So my stethoscope just lives in my bag. Sleep. I really struggle to get motivated and just function if I don't get at least eight hours of sleep per night. Lots of folks with ADHD have sleep disorders too, and a lack of sleep has been shown to make ADHD worse. My favorite right here is the two minute rule. It works so well for me. When I have trouble starting a task or I'm dreading it, I just say, just do it for two minutes. You can do anything for two minutes. And usually that's all it takes to get me started. And once I'm working on something, it's easy to keep going. And then transition time is so important for ADHD. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, give yourself time to switch between tasks. Build in that five minute transition time. Also figure out how long it takes you to get to school or to work. I, I still need to do this. I live four minutes from church. My husband's a pastor and I'm still often late because it only takes four minutes to get there, but I don't factor in walking, parking the car. And so I need double that time. And if you have kids, you need to triple it because I love my kids, but they're a big, you know, drag on the ticket when it comes to getting out the door. So. Calendars, write everything down right away. Just do it. I have a calendar on the fridge and on my phone. And here's the problem with ADHD. Out of sight is out of mind. So I rarely check my phone calendar because I don't remember to go and check it. You know, but I see the fridge calendar several times a day. And again, write it down the minute you decide on a date and a time. So for example, yesterday I decided I was, I talked with my friend, Hannah, we're going to meet for coffee tomorrow at 9 AM. And then when I got off the phone, Mark was like, Hey, don't you remember we're meeting with the accountants at that time, like at 9 30. And I'd already checked my calendar. There was nothing there because I hadn't written it down. I would forgotten. So of course I have to come back to her and explain, I'm sorry, you know, reschedule. But then here, another thing, side note on writing down notes, don't abbreviate things you won't remember. On Sunday, I wrote down, respond to DB on my to-do list. Who in the world is DB? I know so many people with those initials. It took me, I'm not kidding you, three hours to remember who it was because again, our brain has a really hard time with short-term memory. If I don't write it down, it's like it never happened. Sticky notes, sticky notes, put them on your mirror, put them on your door, put them on the air controls in your car, wherever you'll see it, if it's something you need to remember. My friend asked me to pick up her daughter with my kids two days this week from school, and I was just so worried I was gonna forget this child at school. So I put a note on the front door, and every time I go to the door, I see it. It jogs my memory. My kids see it. My kids remind me. And also, my problem is after I've seen a sticky note a lot, I start to look past it, and it just doesn't register anymore. And this happens with my phone. Like, those calendar reminders, if I'm doing something, it, it doesn't register. So, um, so I'll have somebody else write that sticky note because it's different handwriting. It's novel. Or I'll color it, or I'll do like a, you know, something pretty around it that makes you go, ooh, what's that? So I'll look at it, it catches my eye. Do whatever works for you. Bullet journal, this is my absolute favorite. Um, this is such a great way to get stuff down on paper because my brain has way too many tabs open. Um, my tendency is not to remember what I have going on. And so I think I have tons of free time, but Here's my bullet journal. I've actually got it, a picture of it for you right there. If I could sit down and graph out my time visually, I often realize I have no extra time. 
So I need to get moving like right now. If you look at this, like I've got the date, I've got doodles and scribbles that I've done, but then I've also got, I've got my timeline and I actually just color out chunks of time and I, I way overcommit. I, I can see that right now. I've got a to-do list. There's my water, all that good stuff. And up at the top, I've got a note, you know, I'm not decluttering today. I'm writing a presentation. You know, I will do that tomorrow. It's great. You leave it open on the counter. You come by it several times a day. And you check with it. You check off boxes. It's really rewarding. It's so helpful. So here's pictures of other prettier bullet journals because, you know, mine's not that pretty. Um, but it's so helpful. You can do so much with it. And I, it's so much better than a day planner when you have ADHD because those guys just make me feel depressed because, you know, you skip a couple of days there and all of a sudden you're like, oh my goodness, I missed all, I'm spending money on this and I've got blank pages and I didn't do anything. It doesn't matter with a bullet journal. All you do in the beginning is you number your pages and you write an index top. And then when you doodle on a page or do something, you put that in your index. It's so nice to go back and be like, where did I write that? Page 54. Awesome. So it's great. You can do calendars. Um, you can do just big brain dumps, habit trackers. The possibilities are endless. So many ideas on Pinterest. Just when you go there, don't get distracted. Set a timer. All right. Habits. Habits and rewards. If you struggle with something, really work to make it a habit. And yes, use rewards. For example, I have run out of gas twice in my life and it's awful. It makes you feel like a total idiot. So what I do now is I fill up when I go to Costco each week and I love Costco. I really do. So I have to do it before I go into the store, not after, because I'm just too tired and I want to go home. But I go into Costco, going into Costco is my reward after I filled up my car. It's a habit. And then with ADHD, we respond really well to praise. I think we're just craving good attention all the time, but typically we'll just take whatever we can get. So if you post praise from others somewhere where you can see it, it really motivates you to continue. And rewards, rewards boost dopamine because remember dopamine is responsible for pleasure and attention. So find some good, healthy rewards, not food or alcohol, because those things, you know, it's slippery slope with those guys, but find a good book, take a long bath, go for a hike, get your nails done, you know, whatever motivates you. They make me more likely to do the thing again. And these guys must be short-term rewards. Like I cannot get excited about something three weeks from now. It's gotta be like in the next two days. So I do this with my kids every day now because getting ready for school is just awful. Um, I tried everything to get them, put their shoes and socks on, lunches in their bag, get in the car. And then I finally figured out TV is what motivates these kids. So now all I say is, hey, you got to be ready by 8.15 to get that extra five minutes of TV each night. And they move so fast. It's just great. So pick a short-term reward for you, like watching Netflix or something. Um, yeah, figure it out. So mantras. Mantras are great. Pick your favorite motivating quotes. And this is where praise really does work. The last two are, are really not that positive, but they help me. I tend to be very perfectionistic. So I think if I can't do something exactly right, my tendency is just, I'm not even gonna start. So just do it now helps me get started and not avoid it. And that's good enough tells me when I can stop because sometimes I struggle with knowing where to stop and that's good enough works. Okay, all right, now take a look at this room. Isn't that, isn't that great? Yes. And now look at this one. Man, I can like almost hear my brain relax with this. This first one makes me so tense. I want to go running and screaming from it. But this one is so calming. Like the clutter is gone. So with that example comes my next point. Minimize your stuff. Clear your spaces so that there's nothing for you to get distracted with. And here's a secret. The less stuff you have, the easier it is to keep it clean. So good. I get really distracted and anxious and eventually depressed when there's lots of clutter around me. A great movie to watch is The Minimalist. Another one is uh, on YouTube. She's called The Minimal Mom. She is so encouraging. She is so great. Um, I seriously watched this woman and then got rid of like six carloads of stuff over the course of a month. And it, it's so nice to get rid of stuff you don't really use. My house is so much easier to take care of. All of a sudden, I'm able to focus on what needs to get done. It's so helpful. So with school, let's talk about this. How to study before, during, and after class. 
this is really helpful. I highly recommend for class, print out the PowerPoints before class. Don't just have them on the screen in front of you um, because you will remember more if you write on the PowerPoints. So what you do is beforehand, you just read over the notes. Even if you don't understand a single word that they're saying, you've seen the pictures, you've seen some of the notes. And that way, when you get into lecture, you've already seen it and you can fill in the gaps of your knowledge when the teacher is lecturing. And then finally, after class, even if you're bone tired, read over the lecture notes quickly and add anything that you need. So this helps you to solidify what you've just learned. And this transfers from short-term memory to long-term. And then boom, you've just like looked over your notes three times. For class, you must sit near the front of the class. Where you sit in class is directly linked to your grade performance. They've actually done studies that show the farther you sit from the front of the class, the worse are your grades. Um, this effect is even more pronounced if you're shy. Uh, you actually make friends with people who are really interested in doing well in school. So highly, don't, don't sit next to friends that you're gonna be tempted to chat with. That should seem obvious, but just, just don't do it. All right, and then selective note-taking. Write down the main points. You cannot write down everything or you'll miss what's being said. So try to get the main points, write those down. Um, and again, you know, if you can record the lectures, record them so that you can listen to them later. Uh, did somebody have a question? I hear some whispering, anything? Okay, okay, no problem. All right, so again, record the lecture so you can listen to them. Like I used to listen to lectures on my way to different clinical sites in nursing school. You know, my hands, my eyes were busy so that my brain could listen. And then I know, Probably most likely for your college, you have accommodations if you have ADHD that will help with recording these classes or getting like a designated note taker, getting written instructions, not verbal instructions, get written ones so that you can have it, see it, look at it. That'll help tremendously. And then what I always did was I would keep due dates and checklists like in the front or on the front of my binder and definitely keep a binder because remember, you're gonna print out those PowerPoints, right? Um, so print out those PowerPoints and put them in your binder and then check off those due dates. It's, it boosts dopamine. It's rewarding. It's great. All right. And then how to study when you're not in class. Rewriting notes is really helpful. So when you're studying for an exam, I would reread my notes several times and then keep a sheet of paper right next to you. If I came across something that I didn't really understand or I was like, wow, I really don't know that. I would write it on a sheet of paper next to it. And then after you've read through the other stuff, you've got bullet points of stuff that is really important to read. So reread through that note, it really helps. You'll remember more if you rewrite info by hand versus typing it out. Uh, use lots of rewards because it'll get you interested in studying. And then do a little bit each day, set a timer and study for a set amount of time don't say I'm gonna study this chapter because that's just overwhelming. Say, I'm just gonna study for 30 minutes, this subject. Hit each subject every day. So I have students that color code or use different colored pens for different things. That never worked for me, but if it works for you, that's awesome. And then this is something I learned from my cousin's husband. If you are very visually oriented, draw a picture of what you're studying. I used to do this with pharmacology and honestly, the crazier and the more wild your pictures, the more likely you're going to be to remember it. I, I did, I got like 100% pharmacology because I had the weirdest, wildest pictures of things that happen with certain drugs. So it really helps. It's great. Pomodoros. You probably heard about this if you have ADHD. Pomodoro is actually the name of a type of tomato, which somebody thought, hey, let's rename time study sessions Pomodoros. So here's an example. You work for 15 minutes and then 15 minute chunk and with five minute breaks. So you say, I'm doing a Pomodoro, that's my 15 minutes. Um, this is what I do with my kids all the time. So you time yourself here. So what I like to do is I'll do 30 minute sections with five minute breaks and I do three of those. And then I get a 30 minute break to really do something longer that I enjoy doing. I still feel productive. I still feel, still feel good about having something I enjoyed too. Body doubling. Body doubling is, uh, is where you 
it, you're more likely to get things done when there's someone there. They don't have to be working on what you're working on, but they just have to be there working on something and not bothering you. So, and then put your phone away, <laughs> leave it in the other room or get one of those apps that um, helps you to be focused. Like there's a one called Be Focused. And there's also this other great one down at the bottom of the screen right here, it's called Forest. And you have a time session in which a tree grows. And if you leave the app screen to check, you know, that text that just came in, your tree dies. <laughs> so don't, don't leave, you know, your study session. Consequences and rewards, it, it, it helps. And then finally, know how you study best. Do you study best first thing in the morning or at nighttime? If you can only pay attention for long periods of time in the morning or at night, you know, maybe an online course is the way to go for you. Do you study best with other people to bounce ideas off of each other? Or do you need to learn the material on your own? I think I went to one study group in nursing school. I didn't have like a super good grasp on the material and hearing everybody else talk about it made me feel really inadequate and underprepared. So I just, I didn't remember some of the concepts they were talking about. And I just realized that, hey, I need to go study this on my own and be able to teach it to others before I can fully grasp it. So study groups don't work for me and that's okay. Um, they just depress me really. <laughs> um, and then what really does help is I used to only be able to study at cafes. Like I would go get a coffee and I would sit there and I would study and that was great until I had kids. And then all of a sudden you've got a baby upstairs taking a nap and you can't leave the house. So what really helped me was uh, mynoisenot.net. This is an awesome website that actually has all sorts of background noises that will help with studying. They actually have those cafe sounds that I like, that I wanna hear. Um, it's great if you have to pay attention for extended periods of time. I know some people use noise canceling headphones too. Do what works for you. But this bottom one, this is my favorite. I love Japanese garden and it's got these little levers that you can increase, you know, the water sound if you want it. You can get more wind if you want it. You can have more bamboo. It just, you can adjust it. It's just fabulous. So, and it, it would have been really great studying for that LSAT exam that I bombed the first time because what they do is they have classroom noise there. So if you get distracted by the classroom, look, go check out my, mynoise.net. It works, it's great. All right, and then tackling papers. So when it comes to writing papers, we, we ADHDers, we don't do well with long deadlines. Um, so tell me if this sounds familiar. I used to know that a paper was due, I would dread it and procrastinate on it. And I'd wait till like a day or two before it was actually due. And then I'd start, I'd pull all nighters. I'd spend most of my time on the first half of the paper. And then I'd frantically finish the last parts. I would turn it in without proofreading. It was just terrible. It took until I got married to a guy that writes for a living uh, to finally learn how to do it. <laughs> so for ADHD, we need closer deadlines. We need more accountability. Writing a paper for us is like running a marathon. You cannot go out and run 26.2 miles without doing the daily work. So that deadline that's three weeks away from now, that's years away. You need that deadline much closer. So see if you can work with your professors or the writing center or someone that will hold you accountable to bring those deadlines closer. So for example, I have a paper due in three weeks. So this Friday, my introduction section is due. Next Friday, the next two sections are due. And finally, two days before the due date, I have to finish that paper and submit it to them. You must finish that paper and then let it sit for a day and then come back to it and proofread. And my rule is I got to proofread it twice. Um, so you have to break things down into chunks and do those pomodoros with reward breaks to get it done. You just work on a little bit each day to get it done. I know people that like set up a whiteboard with check boxes that they've broken down the parts and they just check it off. That builds momentum. And finally, if you're learning something, you must go to sleep. You just you gotta go to bed. So quickly read through those notes before you go to sleep. It sounds crazy, but even if you don't know the material, your brain will work while you sleep to transfer it from short-term memory to long-term memory. I can't tell you how many tests I like dreaded the night before. 
I would quickly read over the material just before going to bed. I didn't know it, but when I woke up in the morning, I was just amazed by how much more I knew and how better I knew it. It's just, the brain is just truly amazing. So go to sleep, take a melatonin if you need to. And then summarizing, this is so helpful when you have to read something. I learned this trick while studying for the GRE. In the GRE, they present you with like two or three paragraphs and then have you answer questions about it while being timed, it's so stressful. So what you do in the margins is every couple of sentences, you just summarize in a couple words what was just said. So here's my example, two or three paragraph paper about work ethic. You read a few sentences and summarize, work is important. Read a few more sentences, shows effort. Read a few more sentences, summarize, don't be late. A few more sentences, summarize, lateness shows laziness, get fired. You know, so by the end of the paper, I'd have five or six main bullet points and I could quickly go back and answer questions on content. I'd save time because I wasn't rereading information. Whoop, went too far, hang on one second. All right, test taking. So remember that LSAT test that I totally failed the first time? Well, here's what I didn't tell you. The night before I went to take that test, I went to a movie with a friend. I spent the night at her apartment. We stayed up really late talking about the boyfriend that I had just broken up with. I woke up early. I went straight to the test. I skipped breakfast. I walked through the rain in my sandals. Don't ever wear sandals to a test, by the way. And then sat in the middle of the room to take my test. I was cold. I was hungry. I was super frazzled. I got a bad score. Three months later, I took that test and I made sure that I did everything right. All that scribbling noise that had like driven me crazy, I started doing that. I started practicing that. And so what I did is I was underlining and circle stuff that I was reading. It didn't even matter what I was circling. It was just that movement of keeping my hand moving, underline circle, underline circle. It helped me focus all of a sudden. I was not circling anything important, but I was able to read and remember. So the night before it snowed in Boston. So I packed a change of clothes. I think I packed two pairs of socks. I packed extra shoes because I knew that cold feet would just make me miserable. I ate breakfast and then a snack right before. And then I ate a snack two hours at that two hour break. I sat in the back of the room so that there was no one behind me and there was no one to the side of me. And I underlined and just circled my way through that test. And usually with the LSAT, you don't improve your score by more than about five points. I went up 14 points and that's just, it's unheard of, but that's what preparation will do. So for tests, you got to dress for the test, you know, bring extra socks. If you know, you get cold, um, you need to eat carbs or drink some Gatorade, sip Gatorade, <laughs> but glucose feeds the brain write out the answer letters, like if it's A, B, C, and D, and you're looking at a computer, just write out A, B, C, and D, and just cross off those letters as soon as you know that they're not the right thing. Um, it will save you time having to reread stuff, because remember, we don't have great short-term memory. Get there early, look over your notes one last time, and then five minutes before the test, just put it all away. Do some deep breathing, relaxation, pray, Say your favorite quote, your favorite scripture, mantra, whatever, and know that you're ready. So that's it for my tips and tricks. And what I want to close is, is this, that your ADHD is just the label. It does not define who you are or your worth. You are not a weirdo. You are not defective and you are not alone. I hope this presentation has helped because once you understand the issues, and know what works well for your brain, you can avoid so many of the mistakes that I've made. You know the potholes where you have a tendency to fall and you can use these tools to be successful. I wish you the greatest success in your college career. And I hope you will help someone with ADHD someday and teach them what's worked for you. You can do it. You will be amazing. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.